Welcome to The Only Thing That Matters, getting your startup to product market fit on Chicago Founders TV, where we bring you legendary founders and the insights and experiences that allowed them to achieve their success. Today, we have a very special guest, Joe Mansueto, the founder of Morningstar, the $3.2 billion leader in investment research. You may also know Joe as the owner of Fast Company and Inc. Magazines. Now, we all know every idea can't be a $3.2 billion idea. So we're going to start in our first clip with how Joe got the idea for Morningstar. Uh, and, you know, one of the things I did uh, to teach myself about stock analysis was to write away to smart money managers who I admired to see what they were buying for their portfolio. So I'd write away to John Templeton, get his reports. Why is he buying HSBC? I'd go study that stock. What's he selling? So I did this as a way to teach myself about stock anal, uh, analysis, to study the great investors. But as I had all of these mutual fund reports on my table, it got me to look at the fund industry. And I thought, it'd be great if somebody compiled all of this great information into a compendium. And it got me very excited about the concept of a fund. Uh, and I thought these made a lot of sense for the average person to invest in, that for pennies on the dollar, you could hire the very best money manager. Previously, you'd have to be a Rockefeller, uh, Vanderbilt to hire really great money managers, but so fund democratized that. So yeah, mutual funds, it was a very different time and era where mutual funds were a very niche industry. It was not a hot industry by any means. Just to give you some idea, when I started, the whole industry was 300 billion in assets. Today it's 16 trillion. So it's gone up over 50x. Household penetration of funds back then was probably 12, 13% of households invested in funds. Today, it's in the mid 40s. So funds have really gone from a niche industry to something very mainstream, powered by things like 401k plans, which got in people invested for the first time. So talk a little bit about that because, you know, I think everybody feels like I could have seen that any trend with the benefit of hindsight, because of course it's always obvious when the, it's all played out. What, what, what said to you that what, allowed, what do you think gave you that, um, the signals that that would be the case here um, that, that wasn't the conventional wisdom at the time? I think it was a belief in the concept of a mutual fund, that this was a great way to provide investment market exposure to broad masses of people. It made sense to me, again, to hire the very best money managers. You weren't basing a business on... Uh, something that could go away. Uh, I remember in the late 70s, real estate partnerships were very popular. But, you know, a stroke of Congress made a lot of these obsolete. <coughs> but funds, I thought, had a really good future. I, saw, I thought they should be used by more people. But moreover, I could see they were growing, but they were being misused. The people were buying funds for the wrong reasons. So back then, if you could find any data on a mutual fund, it was total return data. And that was it. But I knew enough about investing to know that you could have two funds that each return 10% per year over a decade, but one gets there going like this, and one gets there very steady in a lower risk manner. Two different funds for two different kinds of investors. So what I wanted to do was to bring the same kind of rigorous fundamental analysis that I enjoyed as a stock analyst, which is what I did before I started Morningstar, to bring that to fund investors to help them make smarter decisions. Okay, so a few key takeaways worth noting. First, Joe had been an analyst, which meant he understood this problem firsthand. He saw that there was great research for stocks, but nothing equivalent for mutual funds, and that that was a powerful and compelling unmet need. Second, Joe harnessed a major emerging trend, the mutual fund. Back then, 12% of Americans had mutual funds in their portfolio. Today, it's nearly half. To show you the size of that wave, 300 billion was under management then, 16 trillion today growing 50 times. That is one heck of a wave to ride. Third, Joe wasn't lucky. He earned it. But he did have the good fortune of the 401k and the internet coming along to create entirely new groups of investors and make that wave even bigger. In the next clip, Joe will talk about his initial product, how he learned from it, and how he got to product market fit. Talk a little bit about the very first product. The, what was the initial, the, ver yeah. the very first product? So when I started, I was thinking of uh, electronic publishing. So I databased everything from the beginning. The first thing I did was create a big database. But people didn't really consume 
individuals' um, data in software form in the early 80s. If you can remember, the IBM PC was introduced in 81. PCs were a hobbyist tool back in the early 80s. It's kind of hard to remember that. So what people still consumed were print publications. So I took all the data, I output it from database into these big, you know, computer sheets this big, and then I would have the printer shoot it down to eight and a half by 11, because it was all output on a dot matrix printer, if you remember those things, <laughs> and it made the dots kind of go away if you printed it out big and you shrunk it down. But I printed a 400 page book. Wow. So I started in April of 84. By December of 84, I had a 400 page book, a mutual fund source book, uh, that was output from that database. But it was all, and, I, and then I sold a, a subscription to this book. It came out every three months. You could buy a single copy, you could subscribe during a year. In our next clip, Joe talks about how they created a powerful flywheel, really accelerating growth. So what I was thinking when I started Morningstar was, um, as I mentioned, to help investors make smarter decisions. And the people I was thinking of as our target audience were individual investors. These were the people buying funds. It seemed like the logical audience. And so I reached them through mass marketing techniques. So I took out a full page ad in Barron's, announcing a new tool for the smart investor, 800 number, coupon, uh, direct mail. But what we found pretty early on was that yes, individuals wanted to receive our data, but also financial advisors were emerging as a category, as a key audience. And they needed our data to help uh, manage their client portfolios. Uh, there was a phenomena called the breakaway broker where people, advisors were leaving the big wire houses, the Merrill Lynch's, the Smith Barney's of the world, setting up shop on their own, but then they didn't have any research. So we became their de facto research department. And that became a big audience for us over time. So we started with individuals, pretty soon advisors found us, they became a big audience. They loved us, not only were we helpful in uh, managing their, helping them manage their client assets, but also their end clients knew us. Hmm. They knew Morningstar, so it made it more valuable for advisors to work with us. And then once we had a big audience of individuals and advisors, then institutions wanted to work with us. Why? Because their end clients used our metrics to make their investment decisions. Hmm. So they became a big audience for us. And then we created this virtuous circle that we, you know, with institutions as large clients, we could invest more in improving the data content, expanding all of that, which attracted more individuals, which attracted more advisors, more institutions, and it had this nice network effect that was pretty powerful. It's always interesting to me how often it takes companies two years to reach product market fit. They have to release a product, see how customers react, learn, iterate, release, iterate, learn, and go through that cycle until they really nail product market fit. In Joe's case, we learned how he had his own two-year journey, how he learned and learned lessons he could have learned no other way, and those lessons led to his breakout product, the Morningstar Mutual Fund Report. And the power of those insights led from 120,000 in revenue to 10 million in a few short years. I'd love to go back to the first product because I think everybody loves the hockey stick. We all focus on the up part of the hockey <laughs> stick. But if you think about the hockey stick, it goes straight for a while or a little up. You, you mentioned to me earlier in your first year, you had 100,000 of revenue and then 120, and then you really yeah. started to move up 400 million, 4 million, et cetera, as you go up. Um, and one of the things I think that's interesting in people talk a lot about is there's usually these two-year periods early on in a company's uh, life, the most successful ones, where there's this time of um, figuring things out and you are immersing yourself in a market, you're learning it, you're figuring out the right piece. Um, there was clearly, you know, 20% growth was great, but off 100,000 base was nothing <laughs> compared to going to 400,000, a million, 4 million, 10 million, et cetera. What, what were the insights from that initial product until you started to really hit the inflection point? Yeah, you know, I really needed those first couple of years to really understand the market, understand our clients and what they wanted. I think if I had had a lot of money on day one to really step on the gas hard, I wouldn't have known how to spend that money wisely. So as you mentioned, the first product, it was a quarterly, every three months, and it was largely data. So one, it was not too timely, Second, it was just data, even though we had some analytics like star ratings that were quantitative. But what I saw in, you know, after a couple years was one, people wanted more timely data, and two, 
they didn't want only data, but they wanted analysis of that data. And so two years into the business, we launched what was the real growth driver in the 80s, a product called Morningstar Mutual Funds, which had everything on a single page. It came in a binder, uh, and it had qualitative analysis. So we hired a staff of analysts. Don Phillips, head of our research for many years, was the first fund analyst I hired. And his job was to fill up these boxes with qualitative analysis. It came out every two weeks. Uh, but it was through you know, spending a couple years kind of grappling with understanding the needs of our clients and how you know, iterating on this product, what it could do to be better. And I decided ultimately this was not the right horse to bet on. I needed this other product. And that's when we really stepped on the gas and full page ads in Money Magazine, heavy marketing, and that's when the growth really accelerated. I suppose if I look back, uh, you know, get even more focused on kind of the real drivers of what makes us successful. I've always admired companies where they don't have 17 products, they've got one product, and they just focus on organic growth of that one product. Uh, I think entrepreneurs often have a tendency to want to do a lot of things and things that don't really ultimately drive value. And so uh, I would say if I, I look back, uh, you know, again, we've had a few key product drivers and probably doubling down and really focusing on those and doing less of these smaller things. I hope you got as much as I did out of Joe's journey and success in creating Morningstar. As a bonus feature, we have Joe sharing how a clever business model innovation allowed Morningstar to grow without ever needing venture capital. And it was important to have a subscription because it created a bit of float, deferred subscription income, where people paid us in advance of services to be rendered in the future. And I knew this going in, that it made it possible to get started without a lot of capital because people would pay us in advance. So even before I you know, had to pay Barron's for that first ad, before I had to pay the printer, to pay the, the printing bill, money was coming in. And so this deferred subscription liability today is about $150 million on our balance sheet of money people have paid in advance, or now we allow a bill me option. I didn't in the early days. Uh, but that allowed us to grow Morningstar over the years without raising capital. Our customers essentially funded our growth. So I, th I always advise entrepreneurs to really study that cash flow dynamic. 